You've decided you're ready to become a parent, and suddenly you're overwhelmed with people who feel they have the right to inform you on the correct way to conceive, give birth, what fears you should have, and the proper way to parent. How do you filter through the opinions? How do you know what's trustworthy information and what's a myth or just plain outdated? Welcome to the Birth Ease Podcast. Join your host, Michelle Smith, and her guests as they cut through the noise and fear by sharing valuable tips, tools, and proven methods that help you connect with your own inner wisdom as you navigate the sacred journey that is pregnancy, birth, and parenthood in a more relaxed and confident manner. This podcast does not constitute, nor is it intended, as medical advice. Hello, Birthies families. Welcome to your reprieve from the noise and the stress that can so often accompany pregnancy, birth, and parenthood. I am your host, Michelle Smith. On today's podcast, I will be having a candid conversation with Meg Folsom, a fellow birth guardian, about the importance of choosing your caregiver in place of birth. Meg has been protecting the sanctity of birth as a doula, midwifery birth assistant, birth center manager, childbirth educator, lactation counselor, and placenta encapsulation specialist for 20 years. The depth of Meg's knowledge, insight, and her compassionate heart has touched the lives of hundreds of families in Central Florida, probably thousands, myself included. I am so grateful that she is also one of my dearest friends as well. Welcome, Meg, to the Birthies Podcast. I'm so honored to have you here with me today. Thank you, Michelle. Before we dive into the importance of choosing your caregiver in place of birth, can you share a little bit of your journey with me as a birth professional, Meg? I became interested in becoming a doula after I heard about it, I believe, on an Oak for Winfrey show. So I did some research, found some different organizations that did the certification for doulas, and found one here in Central Florida, Childbirth Enhancement Foundation. I liked their program and their training better than some of the others that I researched. And so in 2000, I started my training and certification to become a doula, which then in turn led me to become a certified childbirth instructor, which then led me down the path of becoming a lactation counselor. So you also worked in the birth center as well, right? Correct. I started at a birth center in Winter Park, Florida, teaching classes with Alice Pillay, who was a certified nurse midwife, who was very beneficial in bringing birth centers to light in Central Florida. When I started teaching for her, I had only seen hospital births as a doula. So I asked her if I could please attend a birth since I was teaching natural childbirth classes for her business. When I saw my first natural birth with a midwife, I was awestruck. I could not believe our bodies could do what they did, despite the fact that I had three children of my own, but they were all hospital births. I experienced this natural birth in the power of a woman, and it just was mind-boggling. That turned into a job with Alice, working not only in her birth center in the clinic, seeing patients prenatally and postpartum, but also assisting at births. So I taught for her. I assisted with births with her. I helped her with clinic. And I also was able to provide breastfeeding support for all of our clients. So it really was an inclusive type of care that your clients received as they worked with you. Absolutely. They came in for their initial visits. We did all blood work in-house. The only thing we weren't able to do in-house were ultrasounds, but we were able to 
set up an agreement with a couple of the freestanding radiology centers and uh, were able to send our patients to their facilities. They came to us for all their prenatal appointments, their lab work, any teaching that needed to be done. We tried to be very proactive, and so we were able to counsel ahead of time on things like gestational diabetes, if their iron got low, if they were having any kind of emotional issues, we had resources we could refer them to. If they were interested in childbirth classes, they could set those up directly through me. Pretty much they could do everything at their appointments. Once they had the baby, they could come back for a two-week visit. They always came back for a six-week visit. But if they needed anything in between, they knew they could always call and set something up and come in. It really is a type of more inclusive care that women can receive at the birth center or with a home birth midwife. And I think it's especially important to receive those extra visits once the baby's born. So often in a hospital birth, a woman gives birth, she's discharged, and then they don't have any contact with their caregiver necessarily until six weeks postpartum. And women could be struggling with breastfeeding issues or baby blues or wondering if their body is healing okay. And just knowing that you can reach out to your midwife and her staff and and get the help you need so readily is really a godsend in a lot of ways. Absolutely. There were several occasions when I would have, uh, especially our younger moms, who would call and I could tell in their voices that they were struggling and we would just tell them, just come on in, come to our come as you are party. And sometimes it was just a matter of being able to sleep. So I would bring the baby in the office with me and we'd tuck them into a bed in one of the birth rooms and just let them get a solid two hour nap. Upon occasion, I would uh, keep their babies on my lunch hour so that they could go locally and have lunch with a friend or with a husband or a partner. All that is so vital after you uh, have a baby. And a lot of times, once you have your six-week appointment, you miss coming in and interacting with your midwives because you do create this incredible bond. And, And me being a very motherly person, I could hug and tell them it's okay and it's normal to feel this way and it is overwhelming and sometimes you wonder, was it a good idea to have this baby? Because you are overwhelmed. But once you get a little more acclimated to motherhood, it does get a lot easier and we do remind our patients it does get easier. All of this speaks so powerfully to our topic that we're discussing today, the importance of choosing the right caregiver for you as an expectant family. And it's really important, I think, to take into consideration what is vital and important to you. Do you want to have an epidural and a medicated birth? Are you okay being induced? Do you want to give birth naturally? How much contact do you want to have with your caregiver? I think a lot of couples don't realize that once you're in labor and giving birth, you may only interact with that physician that you loved so much in the office for maybe an hour. They may not even be on call. And you may not even see them at all at your birth. And these are factors that are really important to contemplate carefully how you want to give birth. So in your experience, Meg, can you share a bit more your thoughts about all of this? I know with my uh, first two births, I went to a practice. There were three doctors and I rotated through all three. But my favorite doctor was Dr. Franz. 
I didn't know I had choices. I didn't know you could have a birth center birth. My sister at the time, whose daughter is 40 now, was in Kentucky, and she had called our doctor, Dr. Franz, to see if he knew of anybody who would do a home birth for her. And he was horrified to think she would want to have a home birth. But it never occurred to me to pursue that when she had told me it it didn't dawn on me I had choices. The one particular doctor I had, Dr. B, I won't say his name, I didn't care for very much. And so when I went into labor with my son, guess who was on call? Dr. B. And being a first-time mom, I was didn't know what to expect. I was, frankly, kind of treated a bit roughly. My son was born, and they took him away to the nursery and left me in a hallway on a gurney. Oh and I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know to ask questions. I was tired, and I just kind of did what I was told to do, and that was the day of the routine episiotomies and enemas and shavings, and I felt very... I guess violated is too strong of a word, but I really didn't care for all that occurred. And then my daughter, who was born seven years later, I had the same experience and the same doctor. Just happened to be on call. So uh, I just remember them telling me, do not touch your baby. You have to have your arms under the blue paper, the sterile paper. Well, when I gave birth to her, of course I touched her and was yelled at for touching my own baby. Uh, When I went into labor, I was probably seven centimeters or further along than that, and they still did the routine, give you an enema and leave you sitting in the bathroom. Nobody to come and help me get up, nobody to, I couldn't call to anybody. I was just, you know, just there. And just treated so rudely and so rough. And even though I had my partner with me, my husband with me, he was of little to no use. (laughs) So I felt very, um, I didn't feel empowered the way I wanted to. And then with my last child, we call her our bonus baby. She came along eight years later. That experience was a little bit different, and I did feel more in control and more empowered. It was still a hospital birth, but I think being as I was older, I knew what I wanted, but again, I wouldn't say it was the ideal birth. I think it was probably better than the other two, simply because they didn't do the episiotomy and they didn't do enemas. And they let me walk around until my water released. And uh, then they wouldn't let me walk around, which kind of was counterproductive because I needed to walk around to get my contractions going. And so, you know, here I am stuck in a bed and uh, my contraction stopped. In which case, then they introduced the Pitocin. I knew nothing about childbirth at that time like I do now. But again, the Pitocin was very unpleasant. And so I ended up getting the epidural with her, which was a relief, allowed me to relax, which enabled me to have her an hour later. But my doctor never made it because she was literally right there and the nurses were begging me not to even cough. So they got a resident, and he was very sweet. He allowed me to videotape. I hate that word aloud, but he allowed me to videotape her birth, which was very important to me. So her birth experience was was very good. But in watching her birth video, which she would watch with me every year on her birthday, she grew up in the business that I'm in now, and she uh, noticed that the nurses were coming by and, and hitting her or kind of giving her a little whack as she was laying in her little plastic bed. And she's like, Mommy, why are they doing that? And I said, because they want to make sure you're breathing. Even though you're laying there peacefully, they 
or checking to make sure you're breathing. So hindsight is everything. Had I known I had options, had I known I had rights, I probably would have taken a different path. And that's why I'm so very passionate now of making sure women know their choices. Yes, I agree so much. You do the best you can with the knowledge that you have, but there's so much that I relate to in your story. The enemas and the episiotomies and not being allowed to touch your own baby. When my first was born, they held my hands down and wouldn't let me touch her. And while maternity care has come a long way over the years, There's still so much improvement to be made. There's such a loss of autonomy. How often do you hear women say, my doctor allowed me. My doctor allowed me to go to 41 weeks of pregnancy. My doctor allowed me to walk around in labor. I was allowed to eat and drink. I think we often don't stop to realize that we women have autonomy over our bodies and over our babies. There's this feeling that the professionals caring for us are in control and that they know more about our bodies and about our babies than we do. And we tend to just turn everything over to them. There can be this feeling that they are here to save us and here to save our babies. And I'm not saying that obstetrical emergencies don't happen because they definitely do. But you and I have been in the business long enough, Meg, to have seen those times where women and heard the stories that they're being coerced and they're being bullied into making decisions that they don't necessarily want to make. And it's important to really contemplate that when you choose your caregiver so that you have someone that's going to create more of a collaborative relationship with you. I also think that women can forget when they're asking their friends and family or colleagues for advice on what caregiver to use, they really need to stop and consider how that person wanted to give birth. Did they want to be induced? Were they looking to have an epidural in their birth? Which is fine. But if you wanted to have a natural birth and your friend is all about inductions and epidurals, their choice for a caregiver might not be, and probably is not the right one for you. No, and I know we tend to scare each other. That's something I find very disturbing, too, is women scaring other women. Oh, my God, let me tell you about my birth. It was so horrible. Oh, my goodness, I don't want to hear that. It's like you see somebody have a, a scar on their wrist, you don't run up and say, oh, my God, you had a horrible wrist surgery, so did I. You ignore it. And I don't know why, just because we see a woman who is pregnant we feel the need to go and scare her to pieces. It's not necessary. And having this fear induced, like if you don't do this, your baby's going to die or, or pulling the, uh, what I call the dead baby card. That's horrible to do to a woman, especially a first time mom who, who maybe doesn't have the medical experience or who doesn't know. And, and our babies and our bodies are so smart. Our babies will let us know if they're in distress. We've got to understand that our babies know what they're doing. They know how to birth themselves. We're just there to help them along. We need to listen to our babies. If our babies are becoming stressed and their heart rates are going up or, or, you know, usually the mom's going to spike a fever if the baby's heart rate is going too fast. And you can pretty much say, oh, let's take mom's temperature. Baby's heart rate is fast. I think if we just trusted our bodies and ourselves and each other a little more and shared good birth stories, 
I always tell my clients, if somebody comes up to you and starts to say, oh my God, let me tell you about my birth. It was so, stop them and say, was it so great? Because if it wasn't so great, I don't want to hear it. I want to hear your happy ever after ending. And so I think as women, we need to empower each other. As mothers, we need to teach our children, our daughters, and our sons about our bodies. If you have a little boy who attends his mother's natural birth at a birth center, that's imprinted in his little brain. That's what he considers normal. When you have a daughter attending your birth, it's imprinted in their brain. This is what's normal. I used to offer sibling classes and I would role play labor and I would make the noises a mom makes and and assure the kids that this is normal, that mom needs to make that strong grunting noise. Or she might let out a scream just because it's good. It feels good. And then I would encourage them. Let's practice that. Let's let out a good scream. How did that feel? Oh, that felt really good. We need to naturalize and normalize birth. Yeah, I agree. I agree. There's too much fear and too many opinions, too much noise surrounding it. I think it's really up to each family to determine what is best for them. If they don't like hospitals, if they have bad experiences with hospitals and they're low risk as a pregnant woman, then look into your alternatives of a birth center or a home birth. If you don't feel safe at home giving birth, and after you've really explored why that is, then a hospital may be a better choice, but find a hospital that supports you in natural birth if that's what you're wanting. Because I know for myself as a doula, and I'm sure for you too, Meg, there's, what words do I have? There's nothing worse And having a mom say after her baby was born how disappointed she was or how it didn't turn out the way that she wanted it to be, if she didn't feel listened to by the staff, that her thoughts or fears weren't even acknowledged or nothing was explained to her, it really is so disheartening to see that because you know that they could have had potentially a different experience. And I think what creates trauma in birth is when women don't feel acknowledged or heard or have their autonomy. If something goes astray in that birth and they have a caregiver that's explaining everything that goes along or acknowledges, yeah, I know you really didn't want to have any Pitocin in your labor to augment things and make the labor stronger, but you've been at nine centimeters for six hours now. So this is the pros and these are the cons. Then the mom can make an educated decision with her partner if she has one. And it makes such a huge difference in how she processes that birth afterwards. I totally agree with that. We're in control of everything else. We don't allow someone else to tell us where we can grocery shop or where we can get our gas or which library to use or or any of those things. And childbirth is life-changing. And a lot of times we'll see moms who come to a birth center for their second birth because their first one was so traumatizing. And I always refer to the second birth at the birth center as This is going to be your healing birth. This is the birth that will heal that first one. And I've seen moms come in, transfer their care at the very last minute, maybe only met us twice, come into labor in total panic. And we have to remind them, this was not baby A's birth. This is baby B's birth. You're in control. You tell me what you want me to do. You tell me how I can better make you comfortable. How can I better assist you in that comfort? Some moms want a water birth and they need someone in the water with them to to help support them. And sometimes that's not something a partner is very comfortable doing. I've been known to jump in the water and help a mom. Whatever it takes to empower her 
give her that birth she wants and have her walk out of that birth center with her baby in her arms and say, I can't wait to do this again. Or being able to send her out into the world with an incredible birth story. Let her birth story be the one to share when she sees someone pregnant. If she feels led to, have her be able to say to a a pregnant mom, Oh my gosh, I don't know where you're giving birth, but I had such a great experience at the birth center or at this particular hospital with this particular caregiver. We need to be that voice for the mothers who don't know, who don't know they have options, who don't know they have choices. I like to always um, encourage my uh, clients and their partners, if they're concerned about medical intervention, ask, is it medically necessary or is just medical protocol? Is it medically necessary for me to be hooked up to an IV? Or could I do a HEPLOC? You know, and if they have someone like a doula or a a caregiver who's going to explain those things, or even a childbirth instructor who's going to explain you have options. You don't have to do the standard what everybody else does. It's called standing orders. And it's so that all the doctors can sit around a table and all agree, yes, when a patient comes in, they're going to get automatically get an IV of, uh, to keep the vein open in case of an emergency. Some of it's not even evidence-based anymore, like immediate cord clamping of the baby. It's not evidence-based, but the protocols are so entrenched. Or even when women are pushing and they're yelling, one, two, three, push, push, push. This is it. Come on, push. Get mad at your baby. It's, I I think it's a horrible way to bring a baby into the world, yelling and telling a mom to get mad at her baby, but it's their paradigm. And sometimes I don't even think they realize that there's another way for women to give birth. Sometimes I think in hospitals, they don't understand or they've lost the understanding because so many births are induced and they have an epidural and there's times where that's absolutely appropriate but I think they've forgotten that we women know how to birth our babies and that we're capable of doing it without intervention oh absolutely and I think you know I would love to see doctors come visit birth centers I know there's a particular practice in town and they love midwives. They learn from midwives. But on the flip side of that, we have become very lawsuit happy. So we're scaring our doctors away. You know, I think it's a double-edged sword. Doctors are afraid they're going to get sued. So they've got to do all what's medically necessary, even though it might be low risk. I think there's definitely room for compromise. But again, you have to have that open dialect between caregivers. And if you are not being heard, if you're being rushed out of an appointment, then you might need to reconsider who you are going to use. I know in the birth center, if we have a patient that takes 30 minutes at each appointment, we make sure we allot her 30 minutes. We're not booking every 10 minutes in case somebody doesn't show up. We want to give that mother time to be heard. And women need to write down questions. They tell you that all the time when you go into an appointment. Write down all your questions and your concerns so that neither one of you are wasting each other's time. I know for me, I was diagnosed with cancer in 2006 and I was, my was like, that was the last thing I was expecting to hear. So when I went to meet with the oncologist, I had a list of questions and brought someone with me because I wanted to make sure I heard what she heard and my husband heard and, and I wanted to know what all my options were. I wasn't going to just go in and start chemotherapy and, lose my hair if I had options. And I think it pertains to really all of our health issues, not just childbirth. 
but especially childbirth because you're forever changed. Once you go from being childless to having a child, your life is never, ever the same. Ever. I agree. I agree. It's a transformational journey. And I think in the hustle and bustle that our medical system that is here in the U.S. now has created, I think sometimes doctors are frustrated too because they only have five minutes with a patient or 10 minutes with a patient. And sometimes some of my clients will talk about they want to ask their physician a question and they feel like the physician has their hand on the doorknob ready to walk out the door before they even get to answer a question and they feel so rushed. So it's really important, I feel, to become introspective and ask yourself, how are you feeling with your caregiver in your appointments? Now, sometimes appointments can be more rushed. And then when the providers there at the birth, they bring a different energy to that. But if you have a caregiver that you're wanting to share with them that you'd really like to have a natural birth, and if they look at you and say, well, you can try, but you're not going to be able to do this without an epidural, but you just go ahead and try. Or recently, a mom told me that her physician told her essentially that she needs to get an epidural, otherwise she'll be too out of control, and that makes it too difficult for the nursing staff and the physicians in the hospital, which I was, yeah, appalled. I hear your breath. (laughs) (laughs) So I think what's not often taken into consideration is so many women are induced these days, and it can be packaged really attractively. Hey, I'm going to be on call, the physician says. So if you'd like for me to be attend your birth, why don't you be induced on this particular day? Or women are tired of being pregnant. So an induction sounds really nice. Or for some women, they feel so out of control, not knowing when they're going to go into labor, how it's going to happen. So the thought of an induction sounds really attractive as well, not realizing that sometimes it can take three days. It's not like you're going to, sometimes it happens that way, but usually you're not going to walk in and have a baby in 12 hours. And there's this push to induce women once they're 35 years old. And so, so many women are induced and it just takes your birth to a whole nother level. I've had two babies with Pitocin and two babies without. And you cannot tell me that those contractions are not different. Not to say that Pitocin can't be very, very useful at times, but inducing a labor is a different matter than going into labor naturally. And that ebb and flow of, whoa, that contraction was really strong. And this one was a little easier. And that one was strong. And You have to take into consideration what environment are you being expected to labor in? And that really determines, I think, a lot of times whether or not you need an epidural. I think the number of women that actually need to transfer from a home birth or a birth center birth due to pain is about 2%. So commitment and environment play a big key. And again, if you want an epidural, please, it's fine. That's not the discussion here. It's having a caregiver that's going to honor you and what you want for your birth and not make one style of birthing superior to the other. I totally agree. When I uh, had my last daughter, I was 42. I was considered high risk. I had the Pitocin, and that definitely is a, uh, I don't know what the word is, definitely a changer in the whole labor scene because they now become in control of your contractions. And they come in and turn up the Pitocin every 15 minutes to get you in that labor pattern they want you in. 
what would normally maybe take your body two, three hours to get to and help your baby acclimate to, they can do it in 30 minutes. And so as a result of that, and then for me going ahead, and and I don't feel I was bullied into an epidural, but I kept getting it offered to me and I didn't really know what it was. But I just knew it would take the pain away because I had a friend who had done it. And then the person who came in to do the epidural happened to be my girlfriend's husband. And he was, of course, so sweet and like, you know, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you get through this. And, and I'm like, okay, great. And it did. I have to admit, it did help me to relax. I didn't feel my body pushing out a nine pound baby. But on the flip side of that, had I known then what I know now, I would have had insisted being allowed to get up and walk around, even though my water had released. I didn't have any fear of leaking on the floor and slipping and falling. That was their fear, not my fear. So again, it's all about being informed. But there are so many other things to take in consideration with birth. Women who have had sexual trauma, women who have experienced sexual abuse, rape, yes. it's a whole different ball game for them. And for those women, they need that extra level of care and understanding. Unless you've been in that position, you can't know how that woman is feeling. And if you can't empathize with her, then you owe it to that woman to at least listen. You're bringing tears to my eyes as you say that. It's so important. How often are women not even... No one asks permission if they can put their fingers inside of her vagina. Exactly. Or they they just, you know, here, open open your legs and... Let me see what's going on. And sometimes when a mom is pushing, it is helpful to have fingers there to help guide the push, but you need to ask her. And if she says, no, stop, you need to stop. Exactly. Her no's need to mean no. They weren't heard when she was abused. I can can vouch from this because I am a survivor of sexual abuse. In fact, one of my uh, little side jobs was teaching doctors at UCF, doctors who saw uh, veterans, women coming out of the military for their well woman checked. A lot of those women were sexually abused. You cannot just go up to a woman and, and remove her gown and start doing a breast exam. There is a way you go about helping these women. Even my own doctor, who I love dearly and I've been going to for 20 some odd years, I had to show him because he had a student in his office when I went in for a well woman check and he asked me, would I be okay with the student doing my exam? And I thought, bingo, perfect chance for me to teach this young deer in the headlight medical student male how to do a proper well woman exam without making a woman feel violated. And even my own doctor was like, oh, oh, wow, because they don't think about it. I haven't watched a show on TV and I watched this doctor just do this. And I was like, no, you can't do that. You have to ask her, let her move her paper gown. She knows how to remove her paper gown. Don't you do it? And, oh, there's just so many things. And I know a lot of um, men and women doctors don't realize what they're doing. And and so for me, that was like a real healing experience to be able to show these men and women how to properly do a well woman exam. And honestly, it doesn't matter if it was abuse or non-abuse. You don't just go remove somebody's You wouldn't walk up to a woman and just shove her shirt out of the way and say, oh, let me check out your breast. You get arrested. So doctors shouldn't be any different. And, And I like to tell, I tell my own daughters, I tell my clients, you are paying them. 
we don't need to be putting our doctors on pedestals. They have an education. We go to them for their education and their knowledge. But the bottom line is they put their pants on the same as you and I. So we have to take them off of that level of this like authoritative, whatever he says goes, and I don't have a choice because he's the doctor or she's the doctor. Right. Right. Well, I think even maternity care is one one of the few, besides maybe pediatrics, branches of medicine where you feel like you don't have a choice or if you don't follow what they say you should do for your pregnancy. And granted, there are some people that, you know, maybe do need some guidance and intervention at times, but that's rare. Most women want what's best for their baby. And we turn over that autonomy to our caregivers because I've had women in my career that have been threatened to have DCF called on them because they wanted to go home in less than 24 hours from the hospital, but their bag of waters had been broken for 24 hours. So they threatened to call DCF on her. There's these really extreme cases. And we really need to begin to take back our autonomy as women. Like we fought so hard for our reproductive rights, for our working rights, but yet when we become pregnant, it's like we turn over all of our autonomy and whatever you say I need to do for my baby. And that needs to stop. It needs to be more of a collaborative care that we women receive. Absolutely. And I think as women, we have to take a little bit of the responsibility. We have to take back our control and our power. We have to become educated. If you don't know where to begin, where to start, reach out to a doula, reach out to a midwife, do a, a meet and greet. A lot of birth centers, a lot of midwives, a lot of doulas offer a meet and greet. But remember, they're professionals. They're not just going to give away their time. So if you want to do a meet and greet, say with a doula, and she says, I would love to do a meet and greet with you. I charge $25. We can meet at a Starbucks. Or that come should to her office yeah. exactly that that should give you a feeling of comfort. She is a professional. We have done this for years. We have been up for forty eight hours straight. I have been pushing with a mom for four plus hours, having to go to the bathroom so bad, having not eaten for, you know, 16 hours, knowing that I'm missing my daughter's choral concert or scrambling to call a girlfriend to take my daughter to get her hair done for her first prom and just praying that this mom would deliver so I could make it home in time, which by the way, I did, but It was not like I could rush this mom to deliver. It's just not how it happens. And so when you have a doula that you're interested in and she charges you a fee for a meet and greet, that's for one-on-one care, professional care. That doula is on call for you pretty much 24-7 for a whole month, two weeks prior to your due date to the two weeks after your due date. Sometimes three for the birth center. You cannot have your baby before 37 weeks. We try really hard, you know, we want that baby to stay in. But if you're going into labor prior to that, then it is a hospital transfer. And then they're on call two weeks after your due date. So between 37 weeks to 42 weeks, they're on call for you. So not to sound a flip, but you get what you pay for. So take that in consideration too. I know when I was looking for child care, I could get child care for $100 a week or I could pay $250 a week. Well, what I saw what I got for $100 a week, no, no, I don't think so. I'm not real comfortable with that. I don't want my kid eating lunch with the cats. So I was willing to pay the 250 
So just, you know, keep that in mind. You have someone who's going to be invested in you, who cares for you, for your partner, your whole family. I feel honored after all these years. I still feel honored when I'm asked to be at a birth. I'm still in awe of how our bodies can deliver this precious little human. I'm just like, wow. And I've always said when I lose that wow, I will totally be done with childbirth. But as long as I still have that wow, I still want to be a part of it. And I respect a woman's decision. My daughter-in-law went the whole hospital route. She didn't want to check out what her options were. And that was fine because it's her birth, not my birth. It was her birth. And I supported and I supported my son and whatever decisions they made. I had to bite my tongue, but but that was okay because I just am so passionate about what I feel and believe in. But again, it wasn't for her. And she did give me a beautiful baby boy. (laughs) Well, grandson, hers, not mine. (laughs) Yeah, and I think it is important to remember that it is that family's birth because sometimes physicians, midwives, doulas, childbirth educators, they will put their goals for that birth on that family. And it's their, you said it exactly right, it's their birth. But at the same time, I think it's important for families to really educate themselves and understand what their options are and not just come from a place of fear. If a woman has a history of severe sexual abuse, sometimes a cesarean birth is the best choice for her, and that needs to be honored, just as if somebody wants an induction or if they want a natural birth. Let's honor where women are at and making a decision, again, from that educated place. It's it's so important, so important. So I have one last question for you, Meg, please. If you could share any bit of wisdom with our birthies families, what would that be? I would like to see women prior to getting pregnant to start doing their research. Yes. Start feeling out the caregivers. Ask your friends who've had babies where they delivered, how they delivered, what did they like, what didn't they like. A lot of my daughter's friends will ask me about certain things. And and my reply to them is do your research. Mm-hmm. Ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Make that appointment ahead of time. Do that meet and greet, whether it be with physician, midwife. Not all midwives are created equal. There are some midwives that I would not recommend, just like there are some doctors I wouldn't recommend, and there's some doulas I wouldn't recommend. But again, it goes along the lines of there are some plumbers and air conditioning people and restaurants I wouldn't recommend. So... I think a woman needs to put more effort into her educating herself because honestly, nobody's going to do it for you. Right. You got to do it for yourself and then seek out those people who you feel comfortable with. Look at the reviews. Um, How long have these people been practicing? I was just heartbroken when my doctor stopped delivering babies because he is so sweet and gentle and he supports midwives. And and I thought, wow, we've lost another good doctor. So empower yourselves, mothers, teach your daughters. A lot of women, girls don't even know their own female anatomy. Teach your sons so that you're, you're, daughter's partner 
can be part of the informed decision. A lot of our men can't even say the word vagina without cringing. So educate your sons also. It's a team effort. Regardless of how a woman chooses to birth, support her. Support her decision. It's her decision. You can offer more information if she would like it. If you'd like to hear about my experience with a midwife, if you'd like to be hear my experience with a doula, I'd be happy to share it with you. And if they say, no, I'm very comfortable with my decision, respect it. Right. Respect, respect, respect. And don't belittle women if they want a natural birth or if they want a birth center birth or a home birth and... Or if you're very natural birth minded, please don't belittle somebody or make them feel bad because they needed an epidural. There's just, there's too much judgment and too much shaming and bullying going on right now. I think even in our community as birth professionals, sometimes let's honor people where they're at. Thank you so much for spending this time with me, Meg. It's been wonderful. If you'd like to have more information, you can go to my birthyservices.com website and you can find out more details about me, the information about Meg, about my birthies method. And thank you again for allowing us to be a part of your journey. Thank you, Michelle. You're welcome. Thank you. If you enjoyed the show, please share it with your friends and rate and recommend it on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Remember, this will be your baby's only birth, and the experience belongs to you and your baby. It's not your friends, your parents, your siblings, or your midwives or doctor's birth. Do your research. Find your inner wisdom and learn to trust it. You already know your baby better than anyone. There's no right way to give birth. There's simply the way that feels best for you. For more great conversations like these, or to find out more information and access Michelle's library of amazing guests, go to birthdeeservices.com forward slash podcasts more information on the Birthies Method, Michelle's classes, meditations, and other services, go to birthyservices.com. <laughs>